Well, good morning, Fairgrounds family. Now, you may or may not actually go to Fairgrounds Road, but because you're involved with us, um, you're Fairgrounds Road family anyway. So good morning, everybody. Glad to have you with us on this Friday morning. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be able to be alive and to breathe God's clean air and to be able to share his wonderful word with you on this day. I hope that you are doing fantastically well. Hope that you are healthy and happy and safe and peaceful and that the same is true for all of your family and loved ones. Good morning, Melanie. Glad to have you here. It looks like it's just me and you right now, but you never know. Uh, I'm sure others will be along here shortly. So um, things are progressing, doing well. I think I shared with you folks a long time ago that I was out of a job and uh, as I'm sort of just waiting for people to come in, I can give you an update. Still out of a job. <laughs> but to be fair, I took the first couple of months, and after 30 years of working, uh, I decided, let me take a break. I'm going to sample retirement. And um, and so just sat around. No, I didn't. I'd sitting around is not actually. I threw myself 100% full-time into the work of the church is what I did, as many of you can attest, because we used to do these encouragements for the week, uh, daily uh, and of course handling all the electronics and the broadcasts and the Facebook live and the um, um, YouTube uh, getting our content out there and doing some gospel meetings and from a virtual standpoint uh, just busy 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 and of course doing a lot of things around the house that were lacking for me having to be at work all the time um, you know machine and technical things uh, that really needed to be done and so doing a lot of that so it's been busy but about six weeks ago or so uh, kind of buckled down and put a resume together and started um, looking around for gainful employment. And so that process is still going on. Had an interview last week, um, actually earlier this week, that went pretty well. So we'll see. We'll see. I'll keep you folks posted and let you know what's going on. Uh, but the work of the church continues, and we are uh, in the process of considering some men from elders. And shortly after that's finished, we'll be considering some men for deacon. Uh, and of course, continuing to do this and continuing to do Bible studies and lessons and sermons and worship services and so on and so forth. And so uh, we are not idle, not idle at all, not by the half. Good morning, Donna. I thought I, thought I saw Gordon uh, pop in as well. Uh, good to see you there, brother. But um, let us go ahead and get started for today. All right. I would ask you, if you would, to prepare yourself by journeying over to the book of Numbers, chapter 13, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, and we're going to, con con we're going to begin our consideration momentarily in the 25th verse of the 13th book, a chapter that is of the book of Numbers. And so I'll start, as I always do, with a question for you. Are you ready for your question? Are you ready for the question? Something we used to say in the church back in the old day. Are you ready for the question? Um... The question this morning is, would you consider yourself a good news or bad news type of person? Now, before you hastily jump to what would seem to be the obvious answer, let me share with you that I know we would all prefer to receive good news over bad news. It's a no-brainer. Believe me, I understand that. Um, but that wasn't really the question wasn't really the question. The question is, are you a good news or bad news type of person? Now, what I mean by that is which type of news gets your attention faster and to which do you more readily respond? And, and listen to this, perhaps an additional nuance of the question would be, do you consider objective information good or bad? Right? What do you mean by that? Um, if someone gives you a piece of objective information, and I wish I had an example that jumped into my mind, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, but you, you could be, you could, you could receive a piece of information about something that's happened. And there are going to be a certain percentage of the people say, oh, no, that's not good. And there will be a percentage of people go, oh, well, there's an opportunity. Um, how about this? COVID-19, obviously. 
in the United States alone, over 170,000 people have lost their lives. That's not good. Um, but a business person who is in charge of, let's say, Zoom or making masks or in the medical field might say, well, here's an opportunity for us to do something good. Perhaps we even as Christians have looked at it and says, you know, it's these type of things that make people go seeking God. And so we're not desirous that anyone would lose their life, but we are in a position to be able to take advantage of the situation in an effort to bring more people to God, right? So there's two good examples of objective information that can be viewed as good news or bad news. Is that all right? Okay. So if you're anything like me, you try to avoid bad news altogether. Who doesn't? Um, I know lots of people who do not watch the local evening news because of the journalistic colloquialism. If it bleeds, it leads. Have you ever heard that? If it bleeds, it leads. And what they typically mean by that is they're going to get your attention focused on the newscast by talking about someone who was shot or killed, someone who experienced their house being on fire, someone who was convicted or what have you. Uh, and, and they usually will that use that as the teaser to get you to tune into the broadcast. Now, why do you suppose that is? Well, clearly, it's because people are drawn to these things. <laughs> they are. It's human nature. Uh, when you talk to someone about who's a fan, let's say, of NASCAR racing, many will tell you that they tune in to see the crashes. Uh, people who watch football, they tune in to see the collisions. People who watch hockey, they tune in to see, you know, the fights that break out that are typical uh, for that sport. And even in our day-to-day -day lives, um, rubbernecking on the freeway, clogging up traffic on both directions because someone unfortunately had an accident and everybody wants to see what happened. I know that we can all identify with that. And then when you see this either in real life or on television, there's a reason why the police have police tape, right? To keep people back. Back from what? Back from whatever it is that they need to investigate or see to. Why? Because people come out of the woodwork to just gawk, to just look, right? And so it seems that we're drawn to things that are potentially bad news. So then we have to ask ourselves, which is it? Are we good news people or are we bad news people? Well, it turns out that there's a very practical reason for asking these rhetorical questions. There is an implication, family, regarding our salvation. Are we more apt to respond to good news or to bad news? And if we do respond, and we almost always do, one way or the other, what will that response be? So, so let's look today at a biblical example of this in Numbers chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 25, and those that are following. Uh, it's a story that we all know, and um, but it's usually the case for us. It bears a closer examination from which we can pull instruction, knowledge, wisdom, caution, and it's Friday, encouragement. How about that? Um, so let's do this. Pardon? Let's take a look at what Thus saith the Lord, and ask ourselves again, are we good news or bad news people? Numbers chapter 13, beginning verse 25. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the lamb. Now, if you're at all familiar with this passage of scripture, you recognize this as the fact that the Hebrews, who had been so recently freed from Egypt and the slavery therein, brought through the Red Sea on dry land, gathered at Mount Sinai to receive the law and the instruction of God, and then taken out on a journey 
toward the land that they had been promised by God through Abraham uh, now find themselves on the border of this land. Okay, that's where they are. Now, um, a member of each of the 12 Hebrew tribes was sent after a long journey um, to this point to specifically check out, or as the Bible says, spy out the land. And there were some very specific instructions that were involved. In fact, we can see that in Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 17 through 20, where here the Bible says, when Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country, see what the land is like, whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to gather and get some of the fruit of the land. For now was the time of the first ripe grapes. So it was actually God, family, who instructed Moses to instruct all the leaders of Israel to go and spy out this land. And we could probably get into some of the whys and wherefores. Um, I think a lot of it was to prove that it, in fact, was the land of milk and honey, that there was plenty that that was there. But it's also to determine, as you can read for yourself, um, what the condition of the land was, what was the condition of the people who were occupying that land. Because, again, if it's a land flowing with milk and honey, um, it's not going to just be sitting there idle. Somebody's going to say, wow, this is some valuable real estate. I think I'll move my family here. And they did. And they built homes and they built cities. And some of those cities were fortified. And so it is as if God says, okay, this is the place that I promised you, but I want you to take a good look at it before we go into it. Because again, the idea was not to come all the way from slavery for 430 years and hang out on the border looking over into the land. The idea was to go and to possess the land and live in it and prosper in it and grow in it. That's what the point of this was. And so the idea now is, well, go take a look. Go take a look. Even Jesus says, listen, you got to count the cost of things. As you get ready to decide what it is that you're going to do, understand what you're getting into and add up whether or not you should do it. I'm not suggesting for any reason that they should uh, have uh, had any... Um, hesitation whatsoever as to whether to go, but just so that they would know what they were getting into. And I'll get into more why that's important in just a couple of minutes. Now, when you take a look at verse two of the chapter, God also specifically says of the people who are going to represent each of the 12 tribes that are going to make up the group of spies that are going to go into this land. He specifically said each man is to be a leader in their tribe. That is important. That's important. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. So now let's pick up the story at verse 27, of Numbers chapter 13, where now the Bible says, Thus they told him, the spies, Moses, uh, and the people, and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Okay? Now, a couple things of explanation here. Um, first, this is the objective report. Family, it is neither good or bad news, but just news. The spies followed the instructions that they were given by Moses as to where to go, what to do, what information to bring back, and even samples from the land. It seems that they followed those instructions to the letter and brought back an objective report that says, Here's what we saw. You asked us to find out if there were people in the land. There are. You said, are there cities in the land? Are there? Tell us whether or not they're large or small, fortified or not. They are large and they are fortified. 
bring back some of the fruit, here's some of the fruit. They did what they were supposed to do. Now, um, just by way of explanation, it talks about uh, the people who live in the land are strong, fortified cities, and so on and so forth. They mention the descendants of Anak. Now, the descendants of Anak are said to be a giant people. Giant people. So when you think giant, think Goliath, because he would have been a descendant of Anak. Um, it is said that Goliath was nine feet tall. Now, I don't want to get too far off in a rabbit trail about that kind of thing. Um, but just imagine, you know, today's NBA players tend to top out at about seven feet, seven feet three. And we consider them to be very, very, very large human beings. Imagine somebody being two entire feet taller than that, right? And probably broader as well. I wouldn't imagine that they were very skinny or anything like that. I would imagine that they were very big people and very strong people. So these people were also in the land. And as you went and checked out the different aspects of the land that God had promised, you had different populations of people living in different areas of it. And so the wilderness and the Negev, the Amalekites lived there. Um, and so the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites were living in the hill country. You know, there's probably more of the uh, fertile land that's there. And then you had the Canaanites who were living close to the coast, and, by, and they always tended to be by the water. So you kind of know who is where, and they were able to report that. Um, I mentioned that they also brought back samples uh, from the land. And so the Bible tells us that uh, they came down to the Valley of Eskol and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes and carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs, which means that the grapes were bountiful and probably pretty large. Now, I, I can't tell you. I mean, I used to imagine that these grapes were the size of basketballs. I mean, there's no reason to think that, of course. Um, but for it to be a um, single branch, uh, that is to say a branch with a single cluster of grapes that had to be carried on a pole between two men, that's a lot of grapes, right? Whatever size they were, it's a lot of fruit, along with the pomegranates and the figs and stuff. And so that was the sample they brought back. And they could say, okay, it is, once again, a land flowing with milk and honey. And here's some of the proof uh, of that. Now, verse 30, verse 30, here's where it's going to get good. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Now, what did Caleb mean? He meant God has brought us to this land. We've gone and spied out the land. We have an objective view of what's on the land, what's going on with the land, who's on the land, and how strong and powerful they might be. And based on that, my report, the glass half full report, the grateful that we have a glass with something in it report, the good report, the good news, if you will, is that we can and should go into this land that God has brought us to and promised us and take it because surely we can, right? That's the good news. Uh, and the Bible uh, reveals to us that he and Joshua of the same mind demonstrated faith in God that despite the land being occupied, they, through the God, uh, through God, I should say, had the wherewithal to go and take possession of it. After all, once again, it was promised to them by God. And it was God who led them to this place. There's no reason why God would promise them a land and not give it to them. There's no reason why God would bring them to this place only to have them to stand on the border looking over into it. And Caleb had the faith. Joshua had the faith to know that whatever was on the land was not stronger than the God that brought them to the land. Is that all right? Um, so, so, so that was the good news. And we have to ask ourselves, how favorably disposed are we toward that report? Now, you can pick this up and put it on any example where we end up having to make a decision. Um, maybe you're shopping for a house. <laughs> and maybe the house 
has some good things about it and maybe some not so good things about it. But you have to make a decision as to whether um, you're going to take possession of that house, especially if you feel like God led that to you, right? Are you going to be a person who's going to look at this despite whatever blemishes there may be and say, mm, yeah, this is home, you know, we can take care of all the small stuff. Or will you have another attitude? Because it turns out that there was another attitude. Verse 31. Here the Bible then says, but the men who had gone up with him, Caleb and Joshua, said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report, bad news, family, of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. Remember, Anak? There we saw the Nephilim. And the Bible parenthetically says the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. So now we're talking about giants. We're talking about people like Goliath, just for your uh, mental picture. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. Wow. What just happened? These men, 10 of them, because we know that Joshua and Caleb had the good news report, 10 men came with the bad news report. Now, it's funny that they both had the same experience. They saw the same things. There was an objective report that just involved the raw data, the basic information. Caleb and Joshua applied some faith to it and said, let's go. These 10 men said, oh, there's no way. This land devours. People are giant over there. And we felt like small <laughs> when we looked at them. And they considered us small when they saw us. Let me first tell you, just parenthetically, be careful how your self-image is influenced by others' image of you, right? That's why it's called self-image. It's the image that you should have of yourself <laughs> without input from anybody outside, but that uh, that's free. Um, once again, this would be the glass half empty report or the bad news. Same objective facts, but seem completely different. Now, I mentioned to you that this was 10 of the 12 spies that had this particular report. And for that reason, you can see that Caleb and Joshua had the minority report, but this represented the majority report. And so I would tell us, family, as Christians and as people of faith, beware the crowd. Beware of the crowd. Um, people of true faith are in the minority. Even the Bible says that we are a peculiar people right? Which means that we're different than the norm. We're different when what is typically expected um, of society, different than what you can normally see. And we should be. Um, here, you have all these people who had the same information, who were given a completely different report. And I would also call this family the faithless report, the faithless report. Once again, if God promises it, he is faithful and just to do what he said that he would do. We have to believe God. If we don't, why would we refer to ourselves as Christians? Why would we bother to spend our time going into a worship service and going into our funds and giving as God has required us to do if we don't believe that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he said he will do? There's no reason for us to practice Christianity, uh, live Christianity is a better way to put it, um, if we don't believe that. The saying goes, if he brings you to it, he will bring you through it. God brought them out of Egypt. Along the path that we've already talked about, Red Sea, Mount Sinai. And they trudged along from Mount Sinai two months to get to this point. It was probably about a seven-day journey or whatever. But you had up, upwards of, of, of a couple of million people who were actually on the move. And so it took them that long to get there. Now, why would he bring you there if he couldn't bring you into the land and be with you as he had been with you in the Red Sea, as he had been with you against the enemies, uh, the army and chariots of Egypt. 
if he had fed you and provided you with water in the desert, why, why would you think that he couldn't deliver on his promise to put you in this land? But these 10 people, now remember, I shared with you that of the people who were supposed to be spies, they were supposed to be leaders of their various tribes, leaders. And so here we are where our leaders are giving us the bad report about God's good promise. That's incredible. It's no wonder that the people lost heart. It's no wonder that the people lost faith because their leaders, save two, gave the negative report. Oh, we just have to be thoughtful about who we allow to be over us as leaders. <laughs> I mean, I shared with you in the beginning that um, Fairgrounds Road is going through a process now where we are um, considering new servant leadership. Um, and that's a process that everybody's involved in. And I, I've encouraged everyone to interact with these men and ask them questions and really kind of vet them uh, because you want the right people to be in leadership. And if you elect, not elect, that's not the right word, and I didn't mean to say that. Um, if, if you find yourself with leaders who uh, are responsible for you and the operation of the church and so on and so forth, and they're faithless men, uh, you are indeed a sorrowful people. That's something that we can't have at all. These men should be the most faithful, not the least faithful. These people took every negative aspect, and there were some, but they blew it up. Family, what we have to realize is that God never promised us a walk in the park in this life, in this faith, in this religion, in Christianity. Never promised that at all. In fact, what he did say is that there's going to be times where you are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> but here's the thing. Watch this. He says that he will be with us. Listen. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to, you're going to avoid going through tough times. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to avoid having tough experiences and negative situations that happen to you. It's going to happen. I'm telling you it's going to happen. But what I'm also telling you is that I am going to be with you. And as long as you stay on the path of righteousness, as long as you follow me, we are going to come out of this and everything will be just fine. You'll be stronger and better and have a testimony because of it. But you have to have faith to walk through it and not run away. And that's what these people were, adv were, were advocating um, that those who followed them would do. That we would avoid going into this land that, that God promised us all together. And so as a result, as I wrap this up for you, the Bible says that the people rebelled. Now we're in verse 1 of chapter 14 where the Bible goes on to say that all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. So here we are on the border of the promised land and all the fruits there. And yes, there are people there and there are big people there. But here you are standing on the border crying and, and, and upset, weeping all night. The Bible says that the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones uh, will become plunder. And, and would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Wait, that Egypt that you were complaining about being a slave in for 430 years, that Egypt? <laughs> the Egypt where you were beaten and forced into labor, that Egypt? You're saying you would rather die than be here? Incredible. Incredible. And there was a further appeal that was made to them. And, you know, we, we could go on. I would just encourage you to read, you know, that next chapter uh, just to kind of see what happens and, and how Moses um, um, pleads for them because they angered God. And, and we all know that they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years for their faithlessness. You know what? You don't want the promised land? Then you don't get it. You don't get it. You'll never see it. You won't cross over into it now. <laughs> it's like when I was a kid, I was really hungry, and then mom put something on the table that I didn't like. And I'm like, I don't like that. Really? Took the plate right off. All right, you can go to bed. But I'm hungry. Hey, you didn't want what's put in front of you, then you don't get anything. Bye. Good night. <laughs> and this is what God did for 40 years. So here again, family, we have to ask ourselves, are we good news people or are we bad news people? 
Are we able to take objective information and see the good in it? Are we faithful enough in our God to be able to take whatever situation that we find ourselves in, see the good in it, and proceed knowing that he's with us? Knowing that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Knowing that he has our back, our front, and both our sides, our up and our down, our top and our bottom. Because if you don't have that kind of faith, then you may find yourself failing. And if you find yourself failing, you may find yourself not in receipt of the good things that God has promised us. Because remember, what is it that we are all hoping to have? An eternity with him in heaven. That is our promised land. There's nothing on this earth that's our promised land. You know, this house is not my promised land. This house could burn down tomorrow. Or I may be in a situation where I have to move out of this house next week, next month. It's not this house. It's not this community. It's not this state. It's not this country. It's not this planet. The promised land is the heavenly realm. The everlasting life is going to be lived. And I have to be willing, and you have to be willing, to have enough faith in God to even when it seems that there are giants in the land, even when it seems that the land devours the people, even when it seems that there are fortifications that will prevent us from moving into a situation, that we have enough faith in God to know that if he brought us to it, promised it to us, that he will bring us into a position to possess The road to heaven is not an easy one. But one of the things that we have to understand and believe is that everlasting life is a free gift that we cannot earn anyway. All we have to do is accept it. Now, the life that we lead and to the point that we get there and can take possession of the land is going to be fraught with highs and lows, goods and bads, um, being led by quiet waters as well as going through the valley of the shadow of death. It's going to involve all of that. But we have to have enough faith to stay the course. We have to be able to take objective news and look at it as good news because we already know the end. We already know how this is all going to come out. We already know that victory has been won. Jesus has defeated Satan. Oh, death, where is thy sting? <laughs> right? All we have to do is work out our soul salvation, live our way, our lives in a way um, that is in keeping with our salvation. And when the time comes, we'll be able to cross over into that promised land. My encouragement to you today, family, is to be good news people. Is to be, we've got a glass and there's something in the glass and that glass is half full people. To be people of faith, to be people of strength, to be people of courage. Because there's enough obstacles out here right now to knock us all down. But God, Holds us up. And if we will walk in his footsteps, if we will walk in his light, then there is nothing that can keep us from the things that he has promised us. Let that be an encouragement to us all this weekend and every day thereafter, family. Be of good courage, be of good strength, be of strong faith. And let's talk a little bit more about faith on this Sunday. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday where we will continue um, in our Bible study with Daniel. 9.30. Uh, I think we're at the point now where um, he is about to interpret, first of all, provide the dream and the interpretation thereof, uh, late second chapter, I believe, of Daniel uh, for King Nebuchadnezzar. And then we will um, have a robust sermon about faith. And I'll give you a little tidbit. That's one of the values, the, the benefits, hopefully, uh, of tuning in on Friday mornings. Uh, so you can get a little preview of the sermon. Uh, it just I was going to talk about this today, and I thought, you know what? That's going to make a really great sermon. Uh, we're going to talk about Abraham and Isaac and God's order to him to sacrifice his God-given son. Now, again, it's a story we know. If we spend any time with the Bible, we do know that story. But as is our habit, we want to... You know, there's a... a um, there's a... Um, documentary series that is out on television. I think it might be National Geographic or something like that, where um, they digitally pull back the oceans so that we can see what's underneath there. 
and whether they're dealing with a shipwreck or some sort of geological structure or whatever, they have uh, radar uh, identified structures underneath the water and so with computers they can remove the water and we can see what's underneath there. And so I, I try to approach the scriptures like that. Everybody can read the scripture. Everybody can understand the basic face value of them. But what's underneath when you dig? We're not talking about additional information. We're just talking about information that we haven't uncovered because we haven't um, taken the time uh, to really deepen our study. Well, let's deepen our study this weekend and let's see what else is there. What's below the surface of God telling Abraham to sacrifice his son? We all know what happened, but what are the implications of it? What can we learn? What can be done to strengthen our faith by understanding more about this story? And so I look forward to sharing that with you on Sunday. Have a blessed Friday. Have a blessed weekend. I thank you all for tuning in, whether you are with us live or whether you come and check us out a little bit later. I thank God for you, and we'll see you again here um, next Friday. Take care.